Okay, so I've just had the thumbs up from the rest of our team. Um, so welcome to everyone who's streaming to watch our second keynote speaker of the Biodiverse Festival 2020. I'm here with Professor Duncan Cameron, who I will introduce in a second. Um, but I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping first. So hello, everyone. I'm Evie. I'm one of the co-organisers and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, so obviously, this is an online event, so there could potentially be some technical difficulties, but we are recording um, the talk. So if anything happens, then we'll be able to upload it later. So don't worry, you won't miss anything. Um, there's going to be a bit of time at the end, about 15 minutes for questions, um, which you can submit in a Google um, form that's in the bio of the YouTube doc, um, of the YouTube video. Um, and also, if you're comfortable with your name being written next to the question, then you can upload it to the live chat. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce everyone to Professor um, Duncan Cameron. He is a leading expert in sustainable agriculture and in 2013 he won an award for he won the he won the World Economic Forum Young Scientist Award and was recognized as one of the forum's 40 extraordinary researchers under the age of 40. He has addressed the UN Paris Climate Conference on so soil degradation um, and not only does he have these incredible academic achievements. He's a gay and disabled role model at the University of Sheffield and he's known university-wide for centering inclusivity in all aspects of his work. Um, so I will be turning off my camera and my microphone just to save internet and I hope that it'll be okay. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'll hand over to you, Duncan, um, to start whenever you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Evie. Um, I felt quite emotional actually hearing you say that. Um, so um, hopefully you should be able to see my slides now, Evie, if you could just let me yeah. know. If yeah. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm genuinely really honoured to be here today. Uh, I, I think Tanith, Evie and the team uh, have done a, an amazing job um, bringing, uh, bringing us a conference that's really celebrating um, underrepresented and minority groups in biology and conservation. Um, and I think it's really important and a timely thing, um, thing that we're doing. So what, what the team asked me to do was to reflect on my career and tell you the story of um, how my research career began, how I ended up um, in a, a refugee camp in Jordan, um, growing food in the middle of a desert, and what my research is going to try and do moving forward in terms of sustainable agriculture. So the, the talk's titled From Aberdeen to Zattery, From A to Z, A Soil Biologist's Tale. Um, so I'm going to talk about my PhD days at Aberdeen through to the work we did at Zattery Refugee Camp. But to be fair, it probably should have started a little bit before A, uh, and in this case with S, with the University of Sheffield. So I'm a, a graduate of the University of Sheffield. I did my first degree here in the, the mid to late 90s. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit of my story and we're going to have a whistle-stop story uh, of the science that underpins it. So hopefully I'm not going too quick, but I'm going to tell you about some of the key experiments that I think have shaped my career and, and got me to, to where I've ended up. So when I thought about giving this talk, it was um, it, it almost felt a bit self-indulgent to talk about me and my career. So I started to have a think about, you know, what is it about my career that's so important to me? Uh, and it's really the people that I've worked with and the places that I've been so fortunate to spend some of my time and do my research. So the theme of my talk is really people, people and places. And the first person that I really want to uh, to mention to you is probably the reason that I'm sat here doing this today. Um, so our Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost, Professor Jill Valentine, has been a real leading light in equality, diversity and inclusion across the HE sector. And long before the ubiquitous rainbow lanyards existed, um, Jill started the, the Rainbow Lanyard scheme and the idea of um, overt allyship, you know, well ahead of the curve. And it's because of her leadership that people like me, I think, probably feel so comfortable being out and proud 
uh, as, acad- as gay academics in universities like the University of Sheffield. So I just wanted to say thank you, Jill, um, because you know you've you've made it so much easier to to do this job uh, and to give this talk. So where did it all start? I guess in terms of research, I've pretty much had a a lifelong obsession with the idea of symbiosis. And symbiosis as a concept, I think most of us recognise, and it has a really simple definition. It simply means the intimate living together of unlike organisms. I was really fortunate in the final year of my degree to go on a field course uh, with my tutor at the time, Professor Mike Sieber Joffe, uh, and Professor Ben Hatchwell, um, both both who uh, had been lecturing me on my degree in animal and plant biology here at Sheffield. We got to spend an amazing week at uh, a field station called the Quinta de Sao Pedro on the Atlantic coast of Portugal. And as part of that field course, we had the opportunity to go out into the landscape and to look at the biology and start asking questions, asking questions about how that biology came about, how it was functioning, how it was regulated, what the physiology and the ecology of that um, of that biology might might be. And me and my team members stumbled across um, a group of aphids that were being attended by ants. And we wanted to understand why the ants were there. Was this a mutualistic symbiosis? Were both partners benefiting in terms of their fitness from this symbiosis? Or was one partner exploiting the other? And through a series of simple experiments, we were able to deduce that um, the aphids who were feeding on the plant were were passing lots of very sugar-rich solution uh, in their poo. Now, that's probably quite a dangerous thing. If you're an aphid, you don't want to end up drowning drowning in your own uh, poo, which is made of sugar. Uh, and you certainly don't want to attract things to you that, that might might kill you, like fungus that would take advantage of the sugar. So instead, the, the ants were taking away that sugar, uh, and they were also protecting their aphid charges. They were almost farming them for this sugar. Uh, and the two partners were benefiting. The ants were defending the aphids and taking away their poo, uh, and the aphids were giving them a sugar-rich resource that um, that they needed. And that was my first window on symbiosis. And when I, I came back from that field course, I was really excited because um, I'd been been offered a project also on symbiosis, but a different type of symbiosis this time. Um, and this was a, a parasite. So a parasite is a symbiont that benefits uh, in terms of its own fitness uh, at the expense of its host, whose fitness is damaged by the presence of the parasite. And I was really struck by the idea that plants could be parasitic. This, this almost felt a, a really uh, animal trait, zoological trait, not something that plants did awfully, awfully often. And I was really inspired by Professor Julie Scholes, who lectured me as an undergraduate uh, and a member of her team, Dr. Anita Gurney. Uh, And Anita and uh, and Julie offered me this amazing project, trying to understand this parasitic plant. Uh, This parasite that got the pretty pink flower is called the giant witchweed, or Strider homonthica. It's a parasite of um, savannah grasslands in Africa, and it causes untold damage to the plants that it infects. And now, unfortunately, the uh, the parasite has entered agricultural ecosystems and it destroyed the rice uh, and uh, maize and uh, various other crops that were being grown in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's responsible for um, large numbers of people going hungry because it essentially steals their food. And Julie and Anita were working to try and crack this problem to understand how this parasite was able to do this and see if there are any clues that uh, that might give us about how we could stop it. And, and I was part of that project, which, uh, I mean, Julie, Julie has just retired, but um, has really taken to fruition. Uh, and a lot of her work is now out in the field, helping people um, that, um, that are suffering from hunger induced by this parasitic plant. And I got a bit obsessed with parasitic plants, if I'm honest. And, you know, I really wanted to learn more about them, but I never imagined I was the kind of person that would that would do a PhD. I knew what one was, 
but uh, I never thought that was that was for me. And it wasn't until the finals were coming out and I'd had an email, and bear in mind emails were new in those days, so I'd not checked my emails for several days, from Mike Zivjothi, my tutor, asking me if I would go and see him. And I thought, oh gosh, I've, I've copped at my finals. This is not going to be good news. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't. I'd done really well. And I'd done particularly well in my undergraduate project. And, and Julie had spoken to, to Mike Zivjothi and said, you should nudge Duncan towards a PhD. So Mike, in his inimitable way, made it clear that um, I was capable of doing a PhD and I should look for one. So I went to see Julie and her colleague, Malcolm Press, and they very kindly pointed me in uh, the direction of who would become my PhD supervisor, and someone that, that absolutely changed my life. So this is Dr. Wendy Seale. Um, Wendy uh, was a plant physiologist and was working on a different kind of parasitic plant. Uh, and this parasitic plant was called the yellow rattle, Rhinanthus minor. Uh, and she had a PhD going, so I tootled off up to Aberdeen for an interview to, to go and study this, this parasite, and I was really pleased I got the job. And I met some really amazing people. I'll tell you a little bit about, about these people and, and the context of the work that I did in Aberdeen and the questions that we were trying to solve and how this work took me to Germany uh, and to China. Uh, and I should say, you know, I'm left with a mark of this parasite because I literally do wear it on my sleeve. This is a, a tattoo that I have, um, which is a copy of a lithograph that Charles Darwin drew of Rhinanthus minor. So I digress. Rhinanthus is, or the yellow rattle, is a, a grassland parasite. It um, attacks grasses and herbs in species-rich meadows all over northern, the northern temperate regions of the world. And... Um, it seems to have a peculiar effect on those ecosystems. So um, if you go into those ecosystems and you count up the biomass or the numbers of grasses, legumes and forbs, so forbs here are our, uh, our broadly flowering plants and legumes are, are flowering plants that can fix nitrogen. And if we focus particularly on the grasses and the forbs, if you go and count that up in communities that have parasites or have this parasite rhinanthus or don't have it, the communities seem to be really different, even if they're just next to each other. So the parasite seems to suppress grasses, uh, and that's a good thing because grasses tend to outcompete the broadleaf plants in, in, in grasslands. So they can often come to dominate and really restrict biodiversity. But in the presence of the parasite, these grasses are suppressed and these forbs, these, these herbs are promoted and they can be promoted really significantly, you know, 50%, 60% increases in, in the, uh, the communities uh, in terms of the, the forbs that are present. And I mean, that's massive. And, and it led Rhinanthus being described as an ecosystem engineer. So we knew it could do this. We knew it could change the communities that it lived in, but we didn't know how it did it. And as a scientist, biologist, I, I wanted to find out, and Wendy wanted to find out how this parasite did what it did. And there have been some suggestions that it might be like a predator. It might be able to go out and hunt for a particular species. But you know, that, that was difficult to imagine. And when we looked at that, we actually found that um, some of the papers that suggested that had actually suggested that it would preferentially attack the herbs, the forbs, over the grasses. So that, that didn't seem to ring true. I thought back to my, my work with Anita and Julie and work that Wendy had done which was using a technique called histology. So they were looking at the, the interface between the host and the parasite. Um, this, this interface between the host and the parasite is called a hostorium. And you can think of it like if you've got a root, if my arm's a root, and the parasite root comes along, it grabs onto it, and it literally rips the root, root open and fuses its own vessels with that of its host, and it sucks its host dry. So by studying this interface, we could start to understand if some species were maybe better hosts because, um, because the Hostoria was better able to get access to resources, and that was our original, original idea. And when we looked at it, 
we found that the Hostoria um, formed by this parasite on grasses were totally different to those formed on the forbs. So in the grasses, they were big, they were chunky, and hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, they have these big kind of penetration pegs, we call them, that went straight into the host's vessels and started sucking. But when we had a look at the forbs, the hosts were already different. They were full of this black goo. Um, and, you know, as any biologist wants to know, I want to know what this black goo was and why it could be related to the, the, the forbs being really bad hosts for Rhinanthus. And Wendy had seen uh, um, an advert for a conference, which is all about microscopy, and there was a talk being given by a chemist. He was using a particular type of uh, spectroscopy. Um, so she was firing lasers at tissues and using that to work out what they were made of. So Wendy booked me a place and told me I was going <laughs> in the middle of the Aberdonian winter. I, I trek out into the middle of nowhere to go to this conference. And sure enough, this technique was phenomenally useful for me. So I came back, I contacted the person that was doing the work, uh, Alison Coates, and she very kindly gave me the opportunity of working in her lab and analysing the chemistry of this black goo. And what this black goo turned out to be was a plastic that plants naturally make called lignin. And the chemical structure of this lignin was totally different between the susceptible grasses and the resistant forbs. And it became very clear that the chemical differences in how this plastic was put together was driving the, uh, the community level effects of the parasite. So the chemistry of a plastic that forbs make is different from the chemistry of a plastic that um, grasses make. And that means that when this parasite enters a community, it causes the community to change because it can compromise the plastic of the grasses, but it can't compromise the much harder and tougher plastic formed by the forks. And this is a hypothesis that I raised uh, and has stood the test of time in collaboration with my dear friend, Dr. Lewis Irving uh, from the University of Tsukuba uh, in Japan. So my PhD finished and I had to have a think about what on earth I was going to do next. And I was pondering that when Professor Ian Alexander, who was my um, head of department for most of the time I was a PhD student, came into my office and said, Professor Sir David Reid uh, and Jonathan Lee, Professor Jonathan Lee, are looking for a new research assistant and uh, they need someone that can do the kind of chemistry you can do. So you should talk to them and he's going to be here tomorrow. So I sat with, with Dave and, and we had a chat in the Botanical Gardens and he invited me back to Sheffield to have an interview. Uh, I was lucky enough to get the job. Uh, and this was to work on a different kind of symbiosis. In this case, the mycorrhizal symbiosis, uh, often called the wood wide web. Uh, I've seen a resurgence in that term in the press uh, recently. And mycorrhiza are uh, symbioses between plants and fungi. And they're near ubiquitous, 95% of all plants that live or have ever lived form this symbiosis. And it's characterised by the exchange of resources. So a plant fixes carbon through photosynthesis. It transfers that carbon into its roots. That carbon enters the fungal, uh, fungal mycelium, the fungal hyphae. Uh, and uh, in return, the, the fungus uses that energy to mine nutrients in the soil and transfer them back up and into the, the host plant. But a lot of the energy that comes out into those mycorrhizae also enters the wider food web uh, and uh, enters bacteria uh, and uh, small arthropods that exist in the soil ecosystem. This is a, a picture of what the mycorrhizal symbiosis looks like between uh, a pine tree and its fungal partner. And the, the question that, we, that, that David had related to a different group of plants that seem to have a bit of a strange relationship with mycorrhiza, and that they are the orchids. So this is the orchid Gugira repens, creeping ladies' tresses. Um, uh, it doesn't look much, but it honestly is utterly beautiful when there's a carpet of it in front of you in a Scottish woodland. And orchids have a really weird life cycle. They produce these tiny little dust-like seeds and unlike most normal plants, these seeds are so small that they don't have enough energy for the seed to germinate and make a seedling. So in normal plants, the mother plant would give energy uh, in the form of carbohydrate 
to the uh, the orchid seed and it would use that, uh, the plant seed, and it would use that to germinate. But orchids don't do that. They, they give it virtually nothing. So instead, they have to undergo a process called symbiotic germination, where the fungus, uh, a fungus comes along in the soil, it burrows into the seed and it starts giving it carbon. And it produces these fungus-dependent seedlings that are called protocorns. And this is a process we call mycoheterotrophy. So um, the fungus providing um, carbohydrate to these, uh, these little seedlings. And these seedlings can spend years to even decades below ground before they undergo what's called a life stage dependent trophic switch. So they go from having no chlorophyll and feeding off the fungus to suddenly becoming green and photosynthetic. And in some cases, in evolutionary time, they've undergone what we call the evolutionary transition and they've stopped producing chlorophyll again. So the assumption has always been that these, these orchids would be parasites, that they would steal carbon throughout their lives. And there's some evolutionary quirk that means that they stop making chlorophyll as an adult because they don't need it. I should say the life cycle completes with seed set of typically around 100,000 seeds per plant. So this didn't quite ring true. Why on earth would the plant produce so much chlorophyll? Uh, and apparently be photosynthetic. So my job was to try and understand if it was possible to measure if carbon was flowing into the mycorrhiza. And lots of people had tried and some really good experiments were done, but no system had quite cracked it. So I designed a system uh, with Irene Johnson, who I've not put a photo up of because she doesn't like having a photo taken, who is a senior technician in, in animal and plant sciences and one of my partners in crime throughout my career. Um, we bust a gut to design an experimental system that would allow us to see the photosynthesis happening and flowing into the fungus. So we managed to do that in this paper. And what you see in front of you is a, a microcosm, so a little tray, um, where we baited the fungus from the orchid's roots out onto agar. And then we'd exposed the fungus, the, the plant's green leaves to a radioactive carbon dioxide. So just like normal carbon dioxide, the radioactive carbon dioxide was fixed. And we can see the plant is glowing with radiation. And we were then able to show that a substantial proportion of that was transferred of that, that photosynthesis was transferred into the fungal partner. And I think this was the subject of the first hate paper that was written about me by a, uh, an orchid enthusiast group um, that said I'd ruined the magic of orchids by revealing that they probably weren't that much different from most other plants. And after the end of that uh, position, after the end of that postdoc, it was, it was time with Dave and Jonathan's encouragement to branch out on my own and to apply for a fellowship. And I was really lucky. I had two back-to-back -back fellowships and some brilliant people, um, some of them are, are on the screen now, that, that helped me through that part of my career. So the National Environment Research Council gave me a fellowship for three years and the Royal Society gave me a fellowship for another eight. So I was really, really fortunate to be uh, able to do whatever I wanted in terms of my research um, for 11 years. Um, I was really fortunate because uh, two of the uh, people in front of you, Dr Janice Lake and Dr Heather Walker, introduced me to a technique called mass, mass spectrometry, which is a technique that essentially enables you to weigh atoms and molecules. And you can do some really cool tricks with that. One of the tricks you can do is you can, in the way you've, I've fed radioactive um, carbon dioxide to, to a plant. You can feed carbon dioxide to a plant that um, is, uh, is heavy, so it's 13 carbon instead of 12 carbon. Normal, more, normal carbon is 12, heavy carbon is 13. And you can use mass spectrometry to find it. And there was another conundrum in these green orchids that, that we knew that they would go through a transition to becoming, um, to becoming parasites in evolutionary time, but we haven't really ever seen that happen. And it just so happened that uh, Sir David knew of uh, a field site uh, in Germany where there were three species that were at different points in that um, evolutionary trajectory from um, 
uh, from being green and presumably photosynthetic through to having no chlorophyll at all. Uh, and in between the two, there was a uh, uh, an orchid, the coral root orchid, orchid Coralariza trifida, I love that name, which had no leaves but still had chlorophyll. And we wanted to know why on earth it would have no leaves if it could photosynthesize. So to try and understand how this evolutionary progression happens, we went out to the field and we exposed the shoots of these plants to heavy carbon dioxide, 13C, across a range of different light levels. And we were able to measure the photosynthetic fixation of that carbon uh, and how that was translocated into the orchid shoots. And, and what we found was a really interesting story that our, our kind of leafy green orchid, as we expected, was very photosynthetic. But our coral root orchid that was green, presumably photosynthetic, couldn't actually do any photosynthesis at all. So it turns out it was a parasite. And it was really these kind of techniques that got me interested in understanding the, the, the wider function of, of plants uh, and how they accessed their nutrients within ecosystems. So this, this is a, a, a figure I've pinched from Ben David and Flaherty um, from the Journal of Mammalogy, which is using the principle of these heavy isotopes to study trophic hierarchies. So the hypothesis goes that if you're at the bottom of a trophic hierarchy, if you're a plant, um, you have a certain natural abundance in heavy carbon and heavy nitrogen. But if you get eaten, the organism that eats you digests you, and it will preferentially use the light carbon, the 12C and the 14N, the, the, the light nitrogen, um, and the heavy carbon and nitrogen will stay in their body, so they'll become enriched in it. So if a herbivore gets eaten by a carnivore, it will become much more enriched in heavy isotopes than, uh, than the, the, the bottom of that trophic hierarchy. And I wanted in this fellowship to ask a question about a group of plants that, that were very similar to the coral root orchids, in that they were green, but they didn't really have leaves. They had these weird little scales and they were tiny. They didn't really, um, they didn't kind of um, look like they were able to fix much carbon, yet they produced these huge fruits uh, from, from disproportionately big flowers. So um, I was really fortunate. I met um, this chap, Jay Berlin, um, uh, just as I started my fellowships. And we we've worked together pretty much ever since. And we were able to crack that question. And when we dug up some of these plants, we found that not only did they not have very much going on above ground, but they also didn't have very much going on below ground either. So they basically had no roots. So how on earth were they getting what they needed? So again, we decided to see whether this idea of, um, uh, of herbivores being eaten by carnivores, meaning that carnivores are enriched in heavy isotopes, um, would allow us to find out how much photosynthesis these plants were actually doing. And this was an idea that was getting traction in the plant science literature. And for two species that were very similar, they lacked, uh, lacked um, real leaves, they lacked m much in the way of roots, we were able to show that up in the, the top of both of these plots that these plants were much more enriched in heavy isotopes than the communities that they lived in. So they were cryptically parasitic on the community uh, by stealing carbon from mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so, you know, we we really start to tease apart the ecology of, of how uh, plants interact with their mycorrhiza. We, we thought they were all happy and mutualistic, but no, the story is much more complicated. They can be parasitic, they can be mutualistic, they can be green, they can be not green. And actually the whole thing's very cryptic and confusing. It just so happened at that point in my career, it was, um, there was a lot of interest in mycorrhizas in the context of sustainable agriculture. And there are two really important people in my career at this point that really helped me branch out on my own. Uh, and they're Professor Tony Ryan and Dr. Richard Summers, uh, who, um, who's a commercial, commercial scientist and head of breeding at RAGT Seeds. And um, I was really lucky because Tony Ryan um, had been following my work and he'd recently had a donation from the Grantham Foundation for Sustainable Futures. And um, 
the Grantham Foundation had, had given him £50,000 as a test donation to see what he did with it. So he, uh, I don't know whether it was a great idea or a daft idea, but it somehow worked. He came to see me and he, he said, look, spend this £50,000 uh, on doing something for your career that will impress the Granthams. Uh, and I've been talking to Richard Summers, uh, RAGT Seeds, about building a project. So we used some of that money to sense check um, an idea that we had about mycorrhiza. So remember, I've said that mycorrhiza, it's not, it's not straightforward. It's not obvious whether they're mutualistic or not. It's a really complicated story. Um, so I, I'd had a, an idea from, from work that I'd read that maybe our agricultural um, our management of agricultural soils might influence how these symbioses work. So if you think about it, in the natural world, you, you're, you're victim to drought, you're dr victim to nutrient stress, you're victim to things trying to eat you. Anything that gives you a benefit in that environment is a good thing. And so mycorrhizas are probably really good. They help you take up more nutrients from the world around you. But what happens if you put a plant in an agricultural ecosystem? If you give it all of the nutrients that it needs, if you stop anything from eating it, suddenly the benefits of having this symbiosis to replenish your nutrients isn't so obvious. So why would you spend carbon energy on maintaining a symbiosis in an agricultural ecosystem when you don't need it, when a farmer's doing it for you? So I hypothesised then that lots of different wheat varieties that we had bred in this circumstance should vary in the extent to which they form mycorrhiza, depending on how intensively bred they are, how old they were, lots of different factors, but there should be huge variation. And that's exactly what we found. We found that different wheat varieties um, could do really well at forming mycorrhiza. So this is at the high end of this graph, and at the low end, there were lots of varieties that were, were more modern, not exclusively so, but more modern, um, that really couldn't form mycorrhiza at all, which could be a problem. It means you're going to have to fertilise them a bit more. But I'd also had a bit of a, uh, an idea that maybe mycorrhizas did more than just give plants nutrients. You know, you, you have the old adage that if your environment's too clean, then your immune system's not going to be very good. Well, it turns out the same's true if you're a plant. So if you're grown in a sterile environment where you don't have many mycorrhiza or you can't access those mycorrhiza, then your ability to defend yourself in terms of your immune system being activated is reduced. So we did a simple experiment where we took a, a wheat variety, we inoculated it with a mycorrhizal fungus or not, challenged it with a pathogen, this is the eye spot fungus, and the results really startled us. We showed that um, the, the, the plants that were mycorrhizal could fight off this infection, but the plants that didn't have the mycorrhizal fungus were, were totally, um, totally decimated, really, by the eye spot fungus, which you can see producing these horrible lesions um, that eventually caused the stem to rot and collapse. And at this point in my career, uh, I'd, I'd met another academic, another early career academic, um, uh, prof now Professor Urian Tom, who's since become a very close friend. And I told him what I was doing and he said, well, that's uncanny because I work on how the environment can induce host plants' immune systems, but I'm interested in bacteria. I wonder if there's a relationship between the two. So we did a, a series of thought experiments and it kind of made sense that actually, you know, we know that plants send signals out into the soil to get hold of their symbionts. Uh, and we know that some of those signals are very similar for bacteria and fungi, and some of them are very different. Um, what we hypothesised, though, was that a plant very strongly signals for fungi when it's very young, uh, and also for bacteria. And if it recruits a consortium of uh, fungi and bacteria into its roots, they could essentially have a, a double whammy effect on activating the, the immune system of the plant and getting it ready, like an immunization really, like, a, uh, uh, like an injection, get it ready to fight off infection. So we, we uh, were talking to a, another 
close friend, uh, Dr. Alex Perez de Luca, he was looking for a fellowship overseas. So we applied for some money from the EU uh, and Alex came uh, and, and was able to demonstrate that these thought experiments were indeed true. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of what got me to the point of my, my real true obsession, which is the most unglamorous, I think, of all of the world's ecosystems, and that is the soil. And I think this, this, this uh, quote is sent to me that, that really made me kind of reflect on how important the soil is. Um, and this quote is, despite all of our achievements, we owe our entire existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. That's quite profound, really, when you think about it. Um, that's why we exist. That's how agriculture works. Without it, we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves. And we know that soil is a, a limiting and non-renewable resource, uh, and we're losing vast ways of it. In the, 19, in the 1930s, um, in the Midwest of America, over-exploitation of the soil um, and over-ploughing of the soil completely stripped it of all of its structure, its carbon, its microbiology. And it meant in a period of drought and some intense wind, the soil literally blew away. And that led the then president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, to write to all of the governors across the, the states um, and in that letter, he said, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Yet we've kept doing it. So we've probably lost a third of our agricultural soils in my lifetime, in the last 40 years. And that really troubled me. And we can see the damage that agriculture can do to soils. Um, just from this experiment, so this is a piece of work that um, one of my closest collaborators and friends, Jonathan Leake, did uh, with a master's student that we followed up with a couple of grants that we had. We did a really simple experiment. He got soil from uh, a transect, so a straight line out of a woodland, through a hedge, a grassy margin, and then two and 32 metres into an agricultural field. And at the top of this picture, you can see a plan view of what the soil looks like. It goes from a nice dark crumb soil under the hedge to concrete 32 metres into the soil. And that's reflected in a 70% loss in the biomass of the wheat plants that are grown there. So we're growing our plants, our crops that we depend on in soils that are so denuded of the resources that they need to support those crops that we lose 70% of growth. Now, that's startling. And that soil is disappearing, like I say, you know, over a third of agricultural soil gone in, in my lifetime. And you can see it happening. You know, this is a storm event two years ago, um, and all the brown around the UK is soil bleeding out of the rivers and estuaries. And that's lost. You know, it can take up to a thousand years to produce a few centimetres of topsoil under normal agricultural conditions. And something was happening at this time where we, we know that agricultural productivity was starting to slow down. So from the 60s up until the 90s, really, we were producing linearly more cereal year on year. But in the mid to late 90s, something changed. Uh, and we were struggling to get more uh, cereal crop out of our soils. And I started to wonder if this was because soil functioning had been uh, had been affected. And I took my evidence, I synthesised it into a policy review which suggested how agriculture could be changed to make it better, and I took that to Paris. Um, Tony Ryan had been invited to the Paris climate negotiations, and he took a team of us where we presented our evidence um, uh, to the, the, the assembled people um, so it could be included in the discussion process. Um, and it was, it, I was, to my surprise, it was really um, championed by the press and up on the front page of The Guardian talking about um, how unsustainable soil loss was and how we needed to do something about it. And I also experienced my first backlash of putting my head above the parapet. Um, and the first, the first attack, uh, well, I had two, two attacks from well-known right-wing news websites via Twitter. These tweets have now been deleted, but I have my screenshots. That described me as um, another peddler 
of uni university disaster pornography. And one commentator questioned that they couldn't help but question the objectivity of a liberal homosexual English professor. I was quite enraged by this, as you can imagine. And I remember sharing it with my family and my father said, well, that's, that's ridiculous. You're not English, you're Scottish. And that put it into context. And that really started my interest in the, the wider issue of food security and food insecurity. And I started working uh, with Peter Jackson and Peter Horton, who's Horton, a, a plant scientist, Peter Jackson, um, a celebrated social scientist, on this, on this problem of food security and how lands and crops interacted with the wider picture of food production. This is often how we think about how our food is produced, from land uh, through to consumers via food, in this very linear farm-to-fork fashion. But when we actually look at what our food system looks like, it's more like this. It's wrapped in all of these complex externalities that regulate how uh, land becomes crop, becomes product, becomes food, becomes something eaten and consumed by consumers. And we wanted to try and understand and uh, map how these kind of supply chains would function. This is when I met Professor Lenny Coe, uh, and we worked together on a piece of work to try and understand how bad for the environment something simple like a loaf of bread was. Um, and in that piece of work, we showed that about an 800 gram loaf of bread um, had nearly 600 grams of CO2 in it. So it produced nearly 600 grams of CO2 from planting the seed to taking that bread off the supermarket shelf. And staggeringly, 43% of that came simply from the use of fertiliser. So it made us realise that we could use these kind of methods to understand how agricultural systems work and suggest something more sustainable. And that's where the idea for Microcosm Farm came in. Tony, my colleagues Jake, Harry, Mark Sinclair uh, uh, and colleagues from Soha University, Raj, Dr Raj, were at um, Marrakesh, COP22, uh, and we came up with this idea of, well, can we make this more efficient by making a farm in a box? Could we replace the soil with something else so we're not degrading soil? Could we use purely green power to power our farm? And the, the idea for synthetic soils was really born. We recognised that we could and that actually soils are one of the things that were limiting agriculture and the sustainability of agriculture. And if we could make a soil out of something that we could recycle and reuse that would still behave like a soil, then that would really help contribute to the climate crisis and to the soils crisis. And it turns out that if you modify the chemistry of a car seat, you can, behave, you can make it behave remarkably like a soil. So um, mine and Tony's PhD student, Harry, did that piece of work. We took it out to Soha University um, in Oman, and we were able to show that actually this farm in a box worked. If you use these synthetic soils, you really could produce lots of food very cheaply and very efficiently. And we realised that we could bring that technology back. So we brought the synthetic soils back to Sheffield, um, and we, we built a community farm in Tinsley, um, that Jake led, working um, with lower socioeconomic groups um, and producing food with them that they wanted to eat uh, at the price that they could afford, which was a really exciting piece of work. Um, actually, that project really spiralled when we recognised that using that technology, um, this is a piece of work led by my friend and colleague Jill Edmondson, that we had lots of space in Sheffield where we could roll that technology out, lots of flat roofs, lots of disused buildings. So these kind of community farms could really contribute significantly to the amount of food that we need to produce. But it also brings us to the last example that I'm going to give, um, which is how we ended up at Zatry Refugee Camp. So all of this work on synthetic soils um, really had a had its biggest application um, in the Zatri refugee camp in Jordan. Zatri is home um, to, um, to refugees from the Syrian conflict, which many people have forgotten about. Um, it's one of the biggest cities, towns cities in Jordan, um, uh, and it's uh, in the middle of the desert. And this chap, my very dear friend Moed Al-Nasmani, 
um, had been working with me for a long time. He's a, a refugee from Syria uh, and a very senior uh, uh, biologist when he was back home in Syria. And he came to Sheffield to do the Scholar Refuge rescue program and work with me and with Julie Gray uh, in, in the biology departments. Uh, and while Moed was, was working with us, Tony had been invited over to Zatri refugee camp by his friend, Helen Story, to see if they could, if, if they could practically do anything to help, if they could co-design solutions with the local population to problems that they had. And I got this incredibly excited text message from Tony. Um, that they were super excited in Satri refugee camp about um, some of his ideas, that they weren't allowed to plant things in the ground, but they had thousands of old mattresses. Tomatoes, here we come. And he sent me this picture of using mattresses as synthetic soil. So I said, well, get some, <laughs> which he did with the aim to restoring the colour green to Zatri camp, because when Tony spoke to the population, that's the thing they missed the most, was the colour green in this very, very monochromatic environment. So Tony grabbed a, a mattress and he got his Zatri mattress foam and it came back to Sheffield and we designed a series of approaches that allowed us to produce a pretty decent crop of tomatoes. We met this amazing chap, Green Hand Man, who um, with Moed's um, uh, hydroponic skills and fluency in Arabic and the work that we'd done uh, between Tony and our, my labs in Sheffield, we were able to take the protocols back to Jordan and the Green Beds project was born. And it started off very small and grew and you can see the produce that was being, being grown with it. But we knew that the project needed support and I think I was completely overwhelmed um, when I checked this a couple of days ago that we've nearly raised through our appeal to keep this work going, uh, a project jointly with the United Nations, over £230,000 um, to secure the future of the Desert Garden. So where do we go now? Well, my work is taking me into new and different places. I've spent time in Australia uh, working with Julia uh, and our, our work was uh, recently, our ideas were recently published in the WWS Living Planet Report um, on making connections from land to sea. What happens if you use crops to feed fish in aquaculture? And I, I, I can leave you to read that if you're interested. And can we actually take the, the synthetic soils and the disease suppressive microbes, can we take that from concept in the lab into commercial norm? Uh, and one of the people I've not mentioned thus far is Professor Tim Daniel, an old friend and collaborator uh, who I'm working with along with all of these other people to take that science into application jointly with um, commercial partners. And the final thing to say is the Institute for Sustainable Food. I was going to show you a video, I don't have time now, but please check out our website and, and have a look at our video about the Institute for Sustainable Food, where we're doing lots of things like this. It's not just about me and Peter, it's about a diverse community of 150 people that are aiming to make um, food, the food supply more secure for everyone. So I guess I'm going to leave it there and say, you know, today's talk was, was really about people and the people that have shaped my career and that I've been so fortunate uh, and honoured to work with. So I'm going to leave their faces up now. So thank you very much to all of you. If you are interested, check out my website or follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Duncan. That was so brilliant and so fascinating, all aspects. Yeah. Um, so we've had a fair few questions come through. Um, so the first one, um, from a soil health perspective, do you know how organic farming fares? So organic farming is very good for soil health. It's not very good for people. Um, so uh, organic farming is usually very good for soil health because it's all about getting carbon back into the soil. But in the absence of using uh, agrochemicals, and some are bad, some are good, um, you know, the the yields are really low. So if there's ever an inequitable way to produce food, then it's um, then it's to do it organically. I'm not saying it's all bad, because I think some of the principles of organic farming are brilliant. And I went on record a number of years ago that landed me in hot water and on the front page of the Metro with the title From Crap to Crop, 
where I suggested that the farm of the future should use GM, princi- GM technology, organic principles and human waste to fertilise our food. Um, and if you check out my website, I actually did a, a, a children's kind of panto type lecture, which is called Everyone's a Fertiliser Factory, which is all about the idea of using poo to grow food. Oh, really nice. Um, so another question that we've got is, what are your thoughts on the 2019 to 2021 agricultural bill in the UK? Uh, <laughs> I think mixed. <laughs> I think it was a golden opportunity to to set out uh, uh, an agricultural set of agricultural policies that would reduce carbon dioxide, support and empower our farmers, and protect food standards. And, and I think I'm really disappointed that our government has failed. You know, if there's I, I'm an ardent ardent Remainer, but if there's any anything good that was to come out of Brexit, it was to get rid of the common agricultural policy, which was a lazy and dreadful piece of legislation. Um, we we lost that opportunity because, you know, we, we haven't thought deeply enough about public payments for public goods, how we support farmers and pay them as custodians of the land to farm in environmentally sustainable ways rather than force them to um, degrade their land, you know, Farmers, farmers are a phenomenal resource uh, intellectually um, and from their own experiences. And I don't think they're championed enough in this debate. And I think, you know, we missed a massive opportunity to support them, to learn from them uh, and to make our food system more sustainable. And we haven't given up. You know, I, I spend a lot of my life giving evidence to committees, lobbying um, government, uh, doing reports for DEFRA. And I think people are starting to listen. But... I, I I'm disappointed that that we didn't that we didn't really grasp that opportunity in the way we could have done. Okay. Um, the next question we've got is: Are you worried that the use of synthetic soils may de-incentivize um, incentivize investment in soil restoration projects? That's from Terry. That's a really really good question. <laughs> and, and, I'm not because I think we've we're at a, a crossroads. So in the UK, um, most of our horticultural production um, occurs in soil and under polytunnels and glass, and most of it occurs in England at least on the the peat rich, carbon rich soils in East Anglia, which are degrading at the most phenomenal rate. You know, the we need to take pressure off those soils, and we need to make that solution the cheapest and simplest solution to move away from using that kind of agriculture on those soils Um, and I think that's where the kind of technology we're developing comes in it's not just for um, electric daisies in urban farms that uh, feed posh restaurants this is about making it really easy and cheap and safe to produce food and the idea of bringing nature into these controlled environment farms using synthetic soil in the form of disease suppressive microbes uh, using these recyclable soils I think if it's done with the correct uh, uh, the correct partners so we're doing it with one of the levy boards that represent farmers uh, the AHDB then I think it's got a really good chance of, of doing good rather than doing bad but 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 it's absolutely true you always run that risk when you deploy a new technology that you de-incentivize current good behavior uh, and i certainly hope that we won't do that <laughs> um when the crop is harvest when the crop is harvested um can the mattresses be reused to grow future crops that's from rosie dunphy so uh, again a good question um yes they can so we can use the the mattress foam several times we can use the foam that we produce for our synthetic soils several times we've done a simulated crop of 10 seasons um thus far and it gets better with time which is really interesting (laughs) as it becomes enriched in in carbon um so i think you know there's lots of um uh there's lots of really um Engage Brian Duncan. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's there's lots of lots of cool stuff going on. <laughs> um, can mattresses provide a suitable medium for growing root vegetables such as potatoes 
or support group crops with large root systems? Great question. Um, we don't know. And I suspect right. probably not. <laughs> you know, there is never a magic bullet. Uh, in, in agriculture there is not a technology that will solve everything uh, i think soil is probably best for root vegetables but i think um salad vegetables uh, and vegetable fruits are probably best produced in uh, a hydroponic in, in some some cases produced in these kind of hydroponic systems it all depends on where you are and what soils you're growing on um uh, and you know the the market pressures and costs of producing those food i think hydroponics is really easy um, if it's if it's done like we did it using recycled materials in a refugee camp, it can be very cheap. It's really easy to learn the technology and to do it at home. So I think it democratises food production at home as well, where um, if you don't have land or if you live in the city and you have a yard, um, then a cheap hydroponic system uh, is is very very affordable and jake has been doing a lot of work designing um hydroponic systems that people could install at home um he he runs the red deer pub as well as being a research scientist and he, he has a hydroponic wall in his garden growing food to, sh to show you that you can do it <laughs> made of recycled bits i should add um do you implement the FWE Nexus concept into your methodology? Um, so uh, I guess by by that they're talking about the food and the energy food uh, water nexus. Uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we we've very much been involved in nexus thinking. Um, uh, we we've had colleagues at Sheffield lead the ESRC nexus project. So I think nexus thinking is all about understanding trade offs and um, understanding potentially perverse outcomes of prodding the system in one place and it responding badly in another. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, that I work with, with Lenny, also with Rachel Rothman, who um, is the head of sustainability for the university, an absolute sustainability superstar. Um, she, she, myself and others have been using these um, uh, LCA, these life cycle assessment uh, modelling approaches to, to embrace that nexus thinking. So saying, right, if we shock the system here, what might what, what might it do? Where where might the perverse outcomes be? And the work that I'm doing with, with uh, Julia Blanchard in Australia, she's a, a globally leading mathematical ecologist. So she builds mathematical models of these food production ecosystems. Um, that means we can say, right, if we divert a crop from land, turn it into fish feed and put it into the sea to grow uh, salmon, what might be the trade-offs where where might that system cause more environmental damage than than it would um, reduce environmental damage elsewhere? So very much embracing the idea of, of nexus thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think this will probably have to be the last question. <laughs> Fifty nine. Um, but someone's asked, how would you recommend getting into soil science post degree? So I think um, I think there are lots of ways of of doing it. You know, I. I was really, really lucky that things kind of fell into place for me and, and I didn't realise how obsessed and interested in soil I was, dare I admit that, until I was quite a long way down the road. But I do a lot of work um, with community groups, with schools, and I think volunteering and learning more about it is, is a really good way of building up a, a skill set that's going to make you incredibly employable um, either for a, a PhD or in the sector. So working with uh, local groups, food groups like Regather and the Sheffield Food Partnership, for example, food cooperatives is a really good way uh, of learning about soil, getting uh, experience with, with farmers and food producers, and that will really set you up for for a career in uh, in sustainable agriculture whether that be in research or or otherwise okay great well um yeah we'll probably have to finish this now um, i just want to thank you again duncan it's been so interesting and laughing getting a bit emotional at some points really <laughs> so fascinating to hear your story um and to everyone watching please tune in at the same time tomorrow we've got dr yoslin um Benitz alfonso talking about um her career and she specializes in plant cell communication so don't miss that okay thanks everyone bye <laughs>